Um, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I know that everybody wants to go and drink beer and eat mini burgers, so I'll try not to keep you here too long. Um, I do find it difficult to stop talking once I've started, so there's that. But we'll try and get through this. Um, it's my story, and it starts a long time ago when I was a lot younger than I am now. Um, yeah, that's me. Uh, I had hair and not quite so fat, but it is me, honestly. And we should really get started on this story at a point where I went to university. So I'd be interested to know, even though I can't really see you all, how many people here have got a university degree or a university education? Yeah, that's pretty cool, a lot of people. Um, I really enjoyed my time at university, but I never ended up actually getting a degree. Um, yeah, I failed university. <laughs> um, I failed university twice, which is kind of a record, I guess. I went to Leicester University and started doing uh, a computer science course, which I found really difficult. Apparently, there's a lot of maths in computer science. Who'd have thought it? Um, didn't find that too easy at all. So I did what everyone does and stopped going to lectures and got a job at British Gas on their database system, um, earning something like something crazy like seven pounds an hour, um, which put me a god among students back in the 90s. So that was really cool. Uh, then I went to uh, Pont de Prix University. Uh, it's probably worth, oh, was there a cheer then? I couldn't. Woohoo! Yeah. I went to Pont de Prix Uni and um, again, uh, really didn't take to uni, but I was very lucky that I got offered a job, which would have been a job I wanted to do when I finished university anyway. So I was very fortunate. Um, at this point, it's probably worth addressing the fact that I am Welsh, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm from this tiny town in South Wales. Uh, it's called Port Albert. It's famous for one thing and one thing only, Port Albert. Um, for scale, we're actually somewhere around here, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but Port Albert's a really interesting town, very small town in South Wales. I mean, if you do a Google image search for London, this is the kind of thing you see, some really amazing photographs, the amazing skyline, you know, some nice red buses. And if you do a Google image search for Port Albert, this is what you see. So we're kind of defined by one thing in Port Albert, and that's the steel industry. There's a huge steelworks looming over the town, and that is how close to the town it is. It's right there on the houses. But it's really fortunate for me because obviously Steelworks have computer systems. So when I wanted to get a job in the computer industry, I was really lucky to have this industry right on my door. Um, so yeah, I went to work for British Steel, which then became Chorus, which then became Tata, blah, blah, blah. And I started work in 1999 on a really interesting problem. So how many people remember the Y2K bug? Yeah, I, I, I can see you, it's good. Yeah, a few people, there's a few people there with as old as me. Um, so I went to start working on their Y2K problem. Obviously, they have a ton of uh, microprocessors across the whole steelworks recording you know, the weight of this vat, the thickness of the steel right here, uh, you know, how much is in this system, how much is in that system. And all of those microprocessors had a problem in 1999 because short-sighted coders in the 60s and 70s had stored the date as two digits instead of four digits for the year. So nobody knew what was going to happen when 99 rolled around to 00, zero what was going to happen. I mean, why didn't these developers in the 60s think their code was going to last that long is the first question. I guess that's what happens to all of us. But it's a really interesting job in theory. Um, but really what I was doing was looking at a spreadsheet and looking at a list of all of the makes and models of the processor, microprocessors we had and then phoning them up and saying, excuse me, uh, manufacturer, is this product Y2K compliant? And if they say yes, I put a tick and we can forget it. And if they say no, then somebody more intelligent than me has to go and look at the ladder logic in the code. So it was not a very interesting job at all, it turns out. There's a lot of hanging around waiting for people to call you back. There's a lot of waiting for emails. There's a lot of searching the web to find out if anyone else has checked this stuff. And so what I did is what most people who have a window computer uh, who have to hang around a lot is I played a ton of meme ROMs. Does anyone know this game? You can shout out if you know it. Super Mario? Dear me, that's terrible. <laughs> Over here, there was a... Circus Charlie, yes. Who, who said that? I'll buy you a beer. Good job. Oh, you've seen this talk before. That does not count. <laughs> that does not count. <sighs> Luckily, I changed up some of the other ones, so we're okay. Um, yeah, I started oh, so much hanging around and so much messing about. Sorry, this microphone's really annoying me. Um, but, you know, there was a whole process control department, so there wasn't just me doing this... Um, 
Stefan, you know, looking at the Y2K problem. We had a whole huge Oracle database that used to take in all of these metrics and all of this data. And what we would do then is pay expensive um, third parties to write screens so the managers can see exactly what's going on on the plant at any one time. But of course, this was only being stored in a database. And so why did we need to actually uh, pay somebody to come in and take this data and present it? Surely there's a better way that we can do this where we can use existing infrastructure and display this data cheaper. And we already were using a Windows NT4 domain, if anyone goes back that far. Excuse me. I did say there should be beer when I had my writer, but it's fine. We were using Windows NT4 domain, so we had a Microsoft infrastructure. We had you know, a Microsoft SQL Server and Internet Information Server at the time. And you know, we had all this infrastructure, so I started looking at active server pages, which could pull the data out of the database and display it in a format. We had a corporate intranet, which used to be like a really big deal back in the like, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, I'm yet to see anyone who actually had a corporate internet that used to display any information that was of any value, but we had one, so it was all good. So, yeah, we started, I started to tinker around with active server pages, and they were really cool. So has anyone, does anyone remember ASP? Classic ASP? Yeah, a ton of people. I did a Google search for, um, for ASP, and this is a genuine image that came up, which kind of sums up how ASP was working for me. It's like trying to get it to work is like rolling a dice. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. More interestingly, to get it to work really well, it's like balancing dice end on end, which is like really hard. So yeah, I started working with ASP, and that was a pretty cool thing. You know, I really started to enjoy this whole uh, more development-oriented job that I was doing. Um, and then I decided, you know, this is really cool stuff, and I want to be able to do this in my own time as well as, you know, in works time. But ASP has a fundamental flaw back then in the, in the 2000s, the early 2000s, which is the cost of the licenses were extraordinary. Like Internet Information Server was really expensive, and, and Microsoft Windows uh, NT Server was really expensive. So it wasn't really something the hobbyist could do. Um, so I stumbled across something called Personal Homepage, or PHP pre -pre -pre, or PHP have to be at too much recursion. Let's leave that there. Um, and I wanted to be able to use this stuff for my own kind of hobbies. Now, I was playing a ton of online gaming, a ton of Counter Strike back then, if anyone remembers sort of semi-competitive Counter-Strike. Um, and of course, we were in a clan. And back then, I think people were more interested not in how you were doing in, in, in the clan leagues, in your ladder, your win-loss ratio. You know, the best clans were the ones with the best websites. So I was like, oh, I can use PHP to you know, create my own website for my own clan so we can look really cool. And I came up with this. And that's a genuine website I did in the early 2000s using PHP. Um, my design skills have actually gone worse since then, so <laughs> that's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the kind of thing that you could do as a hobbyist programmer back then, you know? I had to search the Wayback Machine for this. I didn't actually have a copy of this, you know, anywhere uh, on my own system. And it was very interesting when I looked at the Wayback Machine, because there was only three snapshots, there was, and they were in very quick succession. The first snapshot was of uh, Plesk login. I don't know if anyone remembers like shared hosting where you'd log into Plesk and set up your hosting. So that was the first snapshot. This was the second snapshot, and this was the third snapshot. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of sums up my PHP coding of the day. Um, yeah. It's kind of become familiar to me ever since then, but that's cool. So I was back at work. I was tending to do less development in work and more development at home at this point. I'd gone back to doing kind of mundane work rolling out new PCs and, you know, not stuff that I was really enjoying. So, yeah, I kind of my attention slipped and I ended up playing a lot more main ROMs than I probably should have. Anyone want to shout this one out? Double Dragon from the back and at the front, so good. Yep. So I ended up thinking, you know, it's time for me to move on. I can make an amazing clan page in PHP, you know. I am the boss of this language now. So I did what everyone does when they want to do more, kind of something of a hobby that they want to do more of. I became a contractor, of course, um, because I can do a hobbyist clan website, therefore I should be charging top dollar to <laughs> corporations, right? Yeah. That wasn't the best move I've ever done in my career, I'll be honest, because I was a terrible developer. Um, whoever muttered you still are in the front row. I was a terrible developer, um, but I, f I quickly found a niche, which is really interesting for me. I found a niche where 
I may have been a terrible developer if your metrics were code reusability and maintainability and copy and pasting and solid and all of that stuff. But I found a really quick niche where I had got a really good reputation for being able to get the job done quickly and being able to pick up projects that had faltered and get them finished. Um, so I was an OK developer if getting stuff done on time and on budget was important. A lot of the stuff I was doing was like um, six to eight week marketing campaigns. So the code wasn't going to be long lived anyway. So it didn't really matter if it was held together by you know, string and duct tape for six or eight weeks. Interestingly, one of the jobs I did was for, for Intel, the, the, the processor manufacturer, where they wanted to run a promotion for their resellers. And they, um, they wanted to just basically show a Flash movie where you move, do you remember Flash, yeah? Where you move along the, this path to say how close you are to winning the grand prize. And that was really cool, you know? It, it was a hard job because they were giving me the data in a, an Excel spreadsheet uh, twice a week which I then had to import into PHP and then render out as XML, which sounds really easy, but of course, the spreadsheet didn't come in the same format any two days, so real pain in the ass. But I got a really good reputation of being able to get the job done when other people had kind of failed or they were starting to panic, which is really good. So yeah, not the best code I've ever written, but you know, the money was OK, so there's that. And then my, my, uh, my daughter was born, so it was time for me to get a full-time job because my life as a contractor then, as a single man, you know, I was either really, really rich or really, really poor. There was no kind of middle ground. I was either going on huge four-star holidays or I was like trying to see if my parents would buy me some food. So it's time to kind of get a bit more stability here. So I went to work for a company called Vivo Digital, a really nice little company who were um, doing uh, TV over IP, which was kind of a new thing then. Now it's something we all take for granted, watching TV over the internet or over IP networks. But Back then, it's kind of a new and interesting thing. And we were doing this digital signage stuff, which is, again, you see this in like the smallest corner shop will have a digital sign on the, on the till, on the front of the till. But back then, it's kind of spangly and new. Um, and that was pretty cool. And I got some time where I could rewrite the whole PHP backend that managed the digital signage system. Uh, back then, the way that we would allow people to have more expensive systems, so you could buy the basic system or you could buy the more expensive system, and the way that we decided if people could have the more expensive features was to um, comment out the anchor link in the HTML before we shipped the product to them. And that's the truth. It's like, oh yeah, you haven't paid for that. I'll just comment it out in the HTML. It's fine. You'll never know. Um, so there had to be a better way than that, right? So we had some time. It was cool. I got some time to rewrite the whole system. So I was thinking, oh, we really need something modular where we can just drop modules in if this stuff is enabled. So I Googled, um, as you do. PHP modular framework. I was thinking there must be people, you know. I've, I'd, I'd seen PHP classes, so I knew there were things out there where you could sort of use other people's code. And I stumbled across this, which is the Zen framework 1.7. This is the first version of the Zen framework I ever used. Um, kind of a red letter day for me there, because up until this point, I'd heard of the new keyword, but I didn't know what it was. My, all of my PHP was like, require header, require database, and then run some SQL command in, in amongst the HTML, and then I'll put that straight into the browser. You know, Looking back, terrible, but it worked at the time. It was fine. So it's, this is a point where not only did I find a framework, but I started to learn object-oriented PHP, which is kind of important. And after a while of, of using Zen Framework, I got to understand it. There's a very steep learning curve in Zen Framework 1, but I got over that hill and became an amazing developer again. Excellent. Um, yeah, that's kind of the most dangerous position I've been in, where I think I'm an amazing developer because I can do anything I want in this one specific framework, but I don't really know what I don't really know. Um, I'm looking up, thinking, I'm climbing this mountain, and there's the peak right in front of me, and I've only got 10% to go. And then you take a few more steps, and you find out that's not the peak at all. There's another huge peak behind it that you have to climb. And this point is the point where I think I was my most dangerous. Because I was a terrible developer, I just gave my own joke away, but that's fine. I was a terrible developer. I didn't really know anything about what I was doing. I could copy and paste stuff from Stack Overflow with great efficiency, but that was about it. But at least I suddenly came to the realization that I had huge, huge holes in my, in my knowledge. So I had a lot of questions that I wanted to ask. Um, anyone who used Zen Framework 1 or 2 will know the documentation is not the best. Let's just go that far. 
I can say that because I'm the maintainer of the documentation, so you can hate on me if you use M Framework. I am sorry. So I had so many questions, and going back to my Counter-Strike roots, I was really lucky that I knew what IRC was, and there was a channel called ZF Talk on Freenode. So I joined that channel. Um, not that, you know, not that long into my development career with Zen Framework, and that's kind of when I had the first epiphany that I had about developing. I'd worked for small companies, I'd worked on my own, or I'd worked for small, um, small uh, single developer companies. I didn't realize that I'm not the only person who's doing my job. You know, there's a whole community in this room, a huge community of developers in this room, and everyone, you know, some people will be working for bigger companies where They'll have had peers they work with every day. But for people like me in the room, there's this real kind of moment where you think, oh, I'm not alone as a developer. Other people have the same problems that I have. And other people can help me to solve those problems. And that's kind of a really cool moment in my career when I met some amazing people in that channel. I met people like Ryan Mauser, who was absolutely tireless in answering all of my questions. Even when I thought I was asking Zen Framework questions, and what I was actually asking was basic object-oriented programming questions. <laughs> Ryan still helped me out. He was amazing, you know? People like Rob Allen, who isn't here this year, but has spoken on this stage many times, you know, really, really helpful. Uh, people like Catherine Reeve, who was in the front row here, really helped me out without, you know, you can't tell you how helpful to help me get over that bump and to better myself. So I thank all these people who've helped me along the way. Uh, but Rob and Ryan uh, were speaking to me. We'd been speaking on IRC for a while, bless you, and um, they found out that there was a new user group starting in Bristol, a PHP Southwest was starting in Bristol, and basically they dragged me along. They wouldn't take no for an answer, and they dragged me along to this user group. So this is the first time I went and I met some people I've, I met on the internet in real life. <laughs> I think that's kind of a weird thing to laugh at now, where you know we all do this fairly regularly, but back then it was kind of a weird thing. I'm like trying to say to my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, yeah, I'm just going to meet a group of men that I met on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all men, I apologize. I am saying men deliberately. Uh, but I did go. They did persuade me to go. I was there. This is a photo from the first ever PHP Southwest meetup. I am there. There I am. <clears throat> you could just see my, my big fat belly over there poking out. But I went, and it was amazing. It was completely amazing. I met some people like Stuart Herbert and other people who I now count as friends. It was absolutely fantastic. So the, again, another red letter day. And everyone here, you know, I hope people here who come to conferences will be going to user groups as well, because it's amazing. And that was really cool. Meanwhile, back in my job, we'd kind of ground to a halt. This amazing small company had suddenly stopped getting any sales, and I didn't really have a lot of work to do. So I bet you can guess that I started playing some meme ROMs. Um, anyone want to shout this one out? Gauntlet? No, 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 no. Ghouls and ghosts. Those who said ghosts and goblins, close, but you owe me a drink. Um, so yeah, ghouls and ghosts. This, so I started to, to taper off. We, we didn't get the work. I looked for some new jobs. And there was a really cool company in, in Cardiff called Microcosm Games, a gaming company, which is perfect for me. You can tell already that I really, you know, really enjoy my gaming. So, this company, um, this was, would have been sort of mid-2000s, this company uh, wrote games for Facebook. And when I say games, I obviously mean games. Um, really, they were databases wrapped in pretty pictures that were intended to just spam your friends as much as humanly possible. I'm sure anyone who's been in, on Facebook since like the, the mid-2000s will remember it was the golden age of people like me, because there, no, there were no limits. You could just do everything you wanted to try and get as many sign-ups as you can. But it was quite cool because, believe it or not, a tiny team of six developers in Cardiff had the official license to produce the Lord of the Rings game on Facebook, which now is staggering to think of that. You know, that is unbelievable, but we did. We had that and we wrote some crappy sort of grinder game where you literally just press buttons in random orders and level up and then we try and make you pay to get more energy and one of those great classic Facebook games. But it worked really well. It worked really well. The most interesting thing for me at this point was that we started using Zen Framework 2 for, for our, um, one of our back-end systems. Zen Framework 2 would just come out. It was still in sort of pre-beta. They'd released an alpha at ZenCon, but it was way too early. But it was, it was there. It was working. And I found a bug. And new versions were coming out every sort of three weeks. 
And every three weeks, I had to go and patch this same file because I'd found the bug. And of course, I'm not going to contribute that back. But in the end, I got persuaded to, to create a pull request. You know, instead of monkey patching this file every single release, why don't you just create a pull request and you know, it'll all, everybody will benefit? So here it is, my first ever pull request. In 2011, so we've skipped ahead a few years, but it's in 2011, my first ever pull request, not that long ago. Um, and you can see that the important thing here is that I created the pull request, it was merged. Um, Matthew Weirafini, one of the nicest people I've ever met. You know, this is the way to welcome people into your open source project. That's the way to respond to people who were giving their first contribution there. Note that he says, particularly the tests. I can write tests. Woohoo! So let's just take a look at what that pull request actually entailed before I start congratulating myself too much. So the, here's the test, which I literally just copy and pasted from some other tests that are in the file and changed the string. You know, I didn't know what that was at this point. Um, but still, I wrote the test, right? Copy and paste, change a couple of strings, and then you get a nice message from the maintainer. More importantly, let's take a look at what the actual code change was that I did. So this is my first ever contribution to open source. You know, I added three characters to a regular expression. But it counts, right? It does count. So I've got to mention Matthew Weirafini, who's, who's honestly one of the nicest people I've ever met, been amazing to me in my career, a mentor to me, um, I guess an unofficial one, but definitely a mentor anyway. Uh, the question here I'd like to ask everyone is, this got merged on the 11th of November, 2011. Um, any guesses what I did on the 12th of November, 2011, the next day? <laughs> Played main ROMs is a good guess, but it's not right, yeah? Any? Removed them? No, I didn't revert that. That would have been crazy, no. I made another pull request, a good guess. Uh, actually, I updated my CV. Obviously, I am now a contributor to the Zen framework, and so I should put that on my CV, right? <laughs> and I say that as a joke, but I really mean it. You know, that, that's valid. That is valid. The point here is that contributing my first pull request you know, is, is a really small change. And I will not tell you how scared I was even submitting that. I had several people, some who may even be in this room, to review that for me under the table before I put it public. You know, I really. It took pushing from my peers and my friends to get me to do that tiny pull request, because contributing is scary. Nobody wants to be criticized, right? Nobody wants to be told, oh, you've done this wrong, you've done that wrong. Why are you doing it like this? This way is better. It's a horrible thought. But for me, there was a moment really early on in my contributions where I realized that if you don't take it as criticism, take it as free code reviews, it doesn't suddenly seem to be so scary. I've learned so much stuff from code reviews of my code on open source projects by people who are more experienced, smarter than me, you know, know a ton more than I know. And I've learned so much in my career from these free code reviews that I've got from contributing to open source. It's pretty cool when you think of it that way. You know, it's not quite so scary to think of it as, oh, they're going to criticize me as, oh, they're going to teach me. It's a much nicer way to think of what your contrib contributions will mean. The other point that is important to make is most people really want you to get your stuff merged. Very few people in very few projects will want you, not want you to get your stuff merged. Because if you fix a bug and it gets merged, it's merged for everyone. Everyone gets that bug fix. If you add a new feature, everybody gets that new feature. You know, everybody wins. So most people want you to get your stuff merged. And that's probably the time to mention this guy. Does anyone know Marco? Yeah, Marco's maintainer of the uh, Doctrine product, uh, project. So if you use Doctrine, Marco's the person you should thank. His tireless work uh, makes Doctrine happen. Uh, he's also a, a maintainer of Zen Framework. He's also like the most tireless code reviewer that I've ever met in my life. In a commercial sense, that's really good. You know, I think he's even going to start a business giving code reviews to people because he, his code reviews are spectacularly um, detailed. You know, he, he, he can review your code with such clarity. His comments are like really succinct, and, and he really comments really well. But he does comment quite a lot on your code reviews. Um, the comments do keep coming for quite a while. And even when you fix one thing, there'll be a comment coming about something else a little bit further down the line until the comments are just starting to really annoy you when you see this little Mario in your sleep looking at you. 
Mario then suddenly starts appearing in your inbox and in your GitHub notifications. There's Mario everywhere. Mario is watching you. Marco is always watching you. He's a hard man to please, Marco, but I've learned a ton from him, and he knows this joke, so you know it's all good. But most people want you to get your stuff merged, and this is a free experience to learn. That's a really important thing to think about. If you're trying to learn a new product, I wouldn't you know, advise giving terrible, submitting terrible code just to get the free code reviews. But if you've looked like you've thought things out, and if you look like you've thought things through, and if you just need a small hint, this is the time to get free code reviews, because free code reviews are free learning. So meanwhile, um, these two people who have dragged me to PHP, uh, sorry, PHP Southwest, told me that I was now going to a conference. And again, they didn't take no for answer. They were like, no, we're going to a conference, and you're coming. So I went to PHP Northwest in Manchester in 2012, which is not that long ago either. It's kind of cool. And I had an amazing time there. I met this guy. Um, Evan Curry, who we'll come back to later, super cool guy, done more at 19 than I'd done at 30-something, so an amazing, amazing developer and a really good friend of mine now. Um, I met Lorna Mitchell, again a stalwart at this conference, who became my kind of speaking mentor, really. Um, she's the person who told me that it's a bad idea to give a talk in a Hawaiian shirt, so you can thank her for that. <laughs> I'm still not convinced, but I do take her opinion, yeah. And I also give my first Uncon talk at the first conference I went to, which is really weird when I think back about that now, but it seemed OK at the time. And the Unconf in these conferences, I know some don't, conferences don't have them, but if you go to a conference where they do have one, an amazing place to just get up and give a talk. Um, it would be nice for me to say, look, I had four star on joined in my first talk, but everybody in, my room, in the room was my friend, so <laughs> I only had four stars off my friends in the first talk I ever gave. It's probably a better way to frame that. But that was really cool to get to a conference. So now I've gone from a small user group to meeting new people and, and a lot of them at the same time. You know, really, again, everyone here has probably felt that buzz you get when you come home from a conference and you feel motivated and you've got new things you want to try out. And that's really cool. Yeah, things weren't going well again. Um, I ended up playing a ton of main ROMs again. Life was going downhill in my job. Most people should know this one, right? Yeah, that, there may, that may be lost in translation. Burger time. Yeah, one of my favorites. So it was time to move on from Microcosm Games. We'd lost the uh, license for Lord of the Rings. Apparently, like a real games company wanted to be able to do that. So <laughs> we lost the license overnight. So it was kind of, it wasn't, it wasn't a great separation, but you know, it was fine. I still had to work out a notice period, which is a great time to play main ROMs if you're of that persuasion. Um, I went to work for a company called Yango, which transitioned into AdSpruce. Really cool company in Swansea. I really enjoyed it. But more importantly, I started to submit to conferences. Um, and I started to submit to conferences because I love coming up, as you can tell, and talking to a room full of people where nobody can walk out. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the important thing is to say that this is kind of the red letter day for me. You know, this is an uncon. The, the bottom two uh, uncons. Um, the middle one is a kind of small community conference, which was accepted after I got accepted to ZenCon. So I got accepted to ZenCon for my first ever conference. And the reason that ZenCon accepted me is because of my contributions to their project. I wasn't an unknown entity. They knew that I'd been contributing to Zen Framework, so I knew that I could speak about Zen Framework uh, because I'm contributing, therefore I can be trusted. So that door was definitely opened by my contributions to open source. Um, I've been to PHP UK a couple of times. It's worth mentioning. I've met some really cool people here, uh, people we'll come on to later. Um, and apparently, this happened when I Googled uh, my name and PHP UK. So yeah, that was, that was a good night, I think, if I can remember rightly. Um, but more importantly, you know, this road for me started with contributions. And if you're scared about putting your code out there, contributing is not just about coding. I would recommend anyone tries to aspire to, to submit some um, pull requests to open source software for code. But if you can't contribute with code, or if you know, you're not that comfortable yet, then documentation is a great place to contribute. People will absolutely love you if you start contributing documentation. It's a wonderful way to do. Um, yeah. And if you do want to start contributing documentation, then Framework's a good project to do it on. So <laughs> it's all good. But triage is an amazing thing you can do. 
If you see bugs being reported, all you need to do is look at that bug and see if you can reproduce it. And if you can reproduce it, just put the steps you did on the issue. Because the people coming behind you have to fix those bugs, will absolutely love you for that, for them to have just a reproducible set of steps. You know, that's really cool. And writing tests is another really good thing you can do for projects that don't have a huge test coverage. Um, if you were in Anna's talk earlier, uh, she speaking, spoke really well about testing and you want to level up your testing skills. There's tons of open source projects out there, like Joined In, where we all give feedback, which is, has got low test coverage. And if you start submitting tests there, just because you want to practice writing tests, they love you for it, and you get to practice writing tests. You know, so win-win. Giving answers on places like Stack Overflow or on, on um, IRC, which is what we used to use before Slack came along, so giving answers on Slack. Um, Write in, write in a personal blog about what problems you've solved that day is an amazing way to start contributing. It may not feel like you're contributing officially, but you really are. Because if you're giving answers when people Google problems, you're really helping the community and the project that you're supporting to grow. It's also really good for building a personal brand. I found that blogging is something that I don't do enough now, but early on in my career really, really helped me. And people like Rob Allen, who we mentioned, only blogs when, you know, if he solves a problem for himself, he blogs to remind himself when he <laughs> needs that, fix that same problem in two or three years. And that's a really good way to do it. It doesn't need to be 10,000 words. 100 words is good enough just to do regularly. That's a really easy way to get into it. It boils down to the fact that when you contribute to a, to a project that you use, then you're, you're forced to look further than just the public API. You're forced to look into the code in the vendor folder and understand what's going on under the hood. And once you kind of know what's going on under the hood, then you're an expert in that project, you know, library, framework, whatever it is. If you understand how the code works internally and you don't just use the, the code, the public API to, to call methods, you're an expert in that framework or that project or that library. And when you're an expert, you get all the benefits that come with that expert. And it sounds like I'm trivializing what it takes to be an expert, but trust me, I'm not. I'm really not. As long as you, if you can understand, if you use Symfony, and you can understand exactly what goes on under the hood, then you're an expert in Symfony. And when you're an expert in any project or framework, it has a huge benefit on your career. Effectively, contributing can help you to earn more money, and that's a fact. And it's kind of frowned upon in, in the, these kind of community events to talk about money. It's like, oh. But honestly, I really like money. <laughs> and I'm earning more money now because I started contributing to open source than I was before I started contrib contributing. And that's a fact. That's an absolute fact. When you contribute to open source, you also make connections with the other contributors, which is also really cool because those connections are really valuable to employers as well. So if somebody says to you, um, oh, do you know how this works in Monologue? But you can say, no, but I know Jordi fairly well. I can probably ask him and get an answer fairly quickly. Then there's value in that to employers. So this is another way where you can earn more money by making these connections at the events you're in or making connections to open source. And that's really cool. You know, that is, I was surprised when I realized just how valuable these connections are to employers. More importantly, I guess, is that the connections I've made for open source has come on to become real lasting friends Friends I make an effort to go and see, even outside of conferences or outside of PHP or development. You know, and there's, there's no value on that, really. Let's be honest. So yeah, if we go back to AdSpruce, things had kind of had a downturn, and I had a three-month notice period to work when I gave my notice. So I ended up playing some meme ROMs. Anyone know this one? It's not Daily Thompson. It's a good guess. Track and Field. Track and field yes, Track and Field. An excellent game. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. I started working for a company called Rove. Rove is, um, uh, pff, how do you describe Rove? Um, a high-end consultancy, I guess, for Zen Framework. Zen Framework doesn't have a consultancy brand attached to it, like Symphony has Sensio Labs. You know, there's nothing there for Zen Framework, so we started our own company. Um, and it was this guy who I met at PHP Northwest who persuaded me to come and work for him, which is the best thing I ever did. An amazing company to work for. Um, amazing team of developers, including Marco, uh, Marco Pavetti, as I call him. I know his name is Pavetta, I'm sorry. James Titcam, my go-to guy for a beer when I'm, when I'm at any conference and I need to chill out. James is always there for me. There's a few people at conferences who are always there for me when I need a beer, to be fair. Um, 
Remember when I said Marco's always watching you? There he is, look. <laughs> Derek Rethen's another go-to guy for me for a beer. Um, and also Derek wrote X debug and date time. So there's that in my back pocket when I need those questions answered. It's all good. And Kieran McNulty, who's uh, speaking here at this conference, who's another go-to uh, beer person and maintains PHP spec. So when I have questions about that, I've got that too. There's a really interesting piece of trivia about Kieran. Um, where are you, Kieran? I can't. Oh, right there in front of me. Hello. There's an interesting piece of trivia about Kieran, which I'd like to say is if you Google, so if you were, say, writing a slide deck and you needed a picture of Kieran to put in a, a top trump card um, and you did a Google image search on Kieran's name, you get a very interesting result. So here's a Google image search on Kieran's name. If you can't see it, I'll give you a hint. For some reason, there's a picture of me pulling a bad face drinking a pint of beer when you Google image search for Kieran. That's kind of scary. Yeah, we're back to the main ROM. So I would love to say at this point that uh, life at Rover got terrible and I started playing main ROMs. That's plainly not true. I absolutely loved working at Rover. I'd go back there um, in a heartbeat if you know, the situation ever was needed. But because of, of everything that I've done, oh, before we move on, anyone know this game? Rastan, yes, yes, one of my favorites. Rove, it would have taken a, a pretty special company to come and, and let me move, move on from Rove. Um, and that company came with a, an offer for a developer advocacy job, uh, JetBrains, the company I work for now. Makers of fine IDEs. How many people use PHP Storm? Whoa. <laughs> and web store. And web, any, any IntelliJ ID counts, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Um, uh, interestingly, my job is like really weird. I'm a developer advocate, which means like I get tweets like these pretty often um, from good old Chris there. But yeah, it, it would have taken a pretty special thing. Uh, Cal Evans, who I met many times at events, kind of was the interface between JetBrains and me. So I, again, I only really got the job because of people I knew. And I only knew these people because of my contributions to open source. Um, it's so important to think there's a path for me being on this stage talking to you at this amazing event from this first ever pull request. And it's not, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a direct path. I'm not saying this is um, anything but a very obvious path between me starting to contribute to open source and me getting the job of my dreams, which I absolutely love. And it would be really cool if, you know, I'd love to um, end my, my amazing talk there and have a stand innovation and everybody goes off and drinks beer. That would be awesome. But I'm not going to yet, Joanne, sorry. Because um, there's only a few more minutes, so bear with me. I know everybody wants to attack the bar. Um, but there's a few other things that need to be said. So we've talked about my career and my love of money, um, which is legendary. But there's other things to be said, because it's not actually all about the beer and, and the hot dogs and the money. Um, before I started working in open source, I was living in a tiny town, a steelworking town in South Wales. Everybody looked like me. Everybody spoke like me. Yeah, don't <laughs> <laughs> Who laughed when I said that? <laughs> Everybody spoke like me. You know, I, I was guilty of, of living in a very small-minded, small-town environment. I was, I was living in a community where anyone different, you know, maybe a snigger behind your hand and have a little laugh and a joke. And that's not a nice thing to, to admit, but it's the truth, you know? And getting out there and meeting new people has opened my mind amazingly, and it's improved me as a person. And that's a really important aspect to think about, too. Everyone in this room is doing it. You're all here at events, and that's like one of the best things that's ever happened for me. And it's also important to think that it's not about the beer and the hot dogs, oh, hello, the hot dogs and the elephants, and the money, of course. Um, True North PHP, a year, uh, a year ago, not last year, the year before, I met um, this big fat jerk, Chris Arches, um, the testing advocate, um, my kayfabe enemy, if anyone knows what that means, is a man I love to hate on Twitter, but Really nice to run into Chris, but kind of more importantly, um, and I'm sure Chris won't like that, but I met Ed Finkler, um, who uh, has been touched on in this morning's keynote, and I saw his talk um, where he spoke about mental, mental health in, in mental wellness in the tech community. Um, I mean, an amazing revelation for me. It moved me to tears when I was sat there because I'd been keeping something deep down inside. I've, you know, I suffer with anxiety quite badly myself. So to see Ed, standing up on that stage and openly talking about it made me 
face my realization where I live in Swansea now. You know, there's still a lot of stigma around mental health issues and discussing mental health issues. I had issues I didn't even discuss with my wife, my parents, my, my closest friends. So to be able to actually get treatment for that, which I'm getting treatment now, and to have that life-changing experience because I'm at a conference is an amazing thing. Um, if you need more information about that, osmehealth.org. Come and find me at any point in the conference. I'll, I can always talk to you about that stuff. But that's really, really amazing. So yeah, it turns out it is actually about the beer and the hot dogs. It's about the elephants and the bumper cars. <laughs> More importantly, it's about the money and the friendships. I mean, open source has changed my life, and I, I know that's a really grandiose statement to finish on, but it's the absolute truth. It really has from that moment that I first stumbled into an IRC channel and started incessantly asking horrible questions for people. It's, it's changed my life in ways that you can't imagine, so I, I urge everybody to get involved. I really do. And there's plenty of people who can help you. Most of the speakers at this event will be more than happy to help you if you want to start uh, making a contribution. I mean, it's been amazing, so thank you very much.